So the basics, what and the whys, right? Span or mirror. Even that terminology, every vendor will have a different word for that. So every option I'm going to cover, I'm going to go through its pros and cons. So the good things about a span and mirror port is it's convenient and no additional equipment is required. Easily to configure remotely. That's a big deal, right? That's one of the primary reasons why I prefer to use span or mirror because it's something you can do easily remotely. Now, some of the cons, it will not capture packets that have physical level errors, like truly corrupted packets. Timings may, and I'll actually go on a ledge, they will be skewed, right? There's a very good chance they will be skewed. Some environments require all switch changes to go through change management process. Now, for me, that's a deal breaker because sometimes I'm only on site for a day or two. And if change management requires three to four weeks and we find out, you know, my first hour that we need to span a port, then guess what? This is a problem, right? Span performance, span port configurations can cause negative performance impact, right? And, and the reason why I'm going through that is because sometimes you have a switch that's working marginally or they're heavily loaded. And as soon as you put a span or a mirror command inside of it, you get a problem. Now, I've seen two things happen, right? The good news, and this is going to sound like a kind of a contradiction, but the good news is if your switch really doesn't like it and gets oversubscribed, some switches will reboot. If you've not config saved your configuration, it'll reboot and you'll have your last known configuration. You'll be good to go. Right? If you've saved your configuration, you may get stuck in some kind of loop until you start unplugging ports. I say that's the good scenario because then you know you've done something wrong because you know you want to know. Uh, the bad scenario is the switch does nothing and silently discards a bunch of stuff. You miss packets, the timings are off, but as far as you're concerned, everything looks okay. That's why I call that the worst scenario. The other thing people do is they uh, make a mistake. They will span the entire VLAN. So, you know, span, you know, VLAN one, right? And I want to make sure I get them all. And, and that, to me, that's, that's a bit of an issue because you can easily oversubscribe that port. Even with two or three ports, you can sub oversubscribe your monitor port. So try to stay away from that unless you know exactly what's going on with those ports. Taps. And there's many flavors of taps. And, and I always include this in a tap family, which makes people um, kind of cringe. Taps. Um, Taps let you see everything. So I call a hub a 10100 half duplex tap. Now I've used, I still use hubs. I just used one the other day. Uh, if you just need to find out what's going on, you want to know what IPs they're talking to, what protocols they're using, and the characteristics of an application, yeah, hubs are great. And you probably got a bunch laying around. But just make sure that you put a, a hub in anywhere that those ports are half duplex or figure out correctly that they're half duplex. Uh, but just a little, just, I, I guess that's a side note, right? So what's the good thing? You're going to get all the packets, right? Even the corrupted or errored ones. The timings are accurate. And there's no equipment configuration changes to be made. So I don't need to go into a switch and change stuff and worry about that sort of argument with change management. Now, what change management does come into play, oh, a little typo right there. So you're going to have to break the physical connection with whatever you're monitoring. And now if it's a client computer, this may not be an issue. I say may because some environments, even that becomes a big, big deal. Um, if it's a server or a firewall, then that's even obviously a bigger deal, right? That may fall into that change management process. Again, it may take, you know, three to four weeks, two to three months. And if I'm there for only a day, well, guess what? We're done. Ensure you have the correct interfaces for fiber. And that's becoming a big deal as more and more fibers out there. We have legacy fiber, the current fiber. You really need to know what your connectors are. When you use hubs, as I said, make sure all the ports are half duplex or set for half duplex. And you need to know your capture device limitations. So if you can use your laptop, right, or your desktop, whatever it happens to be, uh, you need to find out at what point will it not keep up with the packet rate. Now, secondary note is even if it does keep up with all the packets, you need to find out how accurate the timestamps are. So that becomes a secondary issue. Now, the last note is what we're covering now, and that's issues if the capture device's MAC address appears on the switch port. And, for example, port security, right? So the port could get shut down, or there's a flag or a trap, or, you know, the corporate security guys come down on you, that sort of thing. You need to understand what you're playing with in that environment. So the plan here is to test port security with various capture configurations. So there's my switch port. I need to know that because I'm going to be doing some show interface commands. And then that cable goes to a box, which could be a tap or a hub or whatever we happen to use at that time. 
there's the device I'm monitoring, and that's me, the guy who's capturing or monitoring the conversation. Now, we're going to start with the good old hub, right? Just because I want to start with kind of a baseline, so to speak. I know this is going to cause a problem. I just want to make sure it does and that my configuration on the switch is working as I think it should. So the first thing we do is check the switch port for MAC addresses without me even connected. I want to make sure I only see one MAC address. The reason why that's important, some switches, depending on how you configure things, you might actually see two MAC addresses on that port. So if you were to set a port security for one MAC, then you would cause a problem right out of the gate. Um, I've also seen some switches where if you have a lot of errors on the port, you end up with these imaginary MAC addresses on the port. So please make sure you know how your specific switch behaves before you put port security in, okay? So in my case, it's only one MAC address, so I'm good to go, and that's exactly what I expected to see. If I do my check port security command, so show port dash security interface, the interface we're connected to, I'm going to make sure this port security is disabled right now because I haven't done anything. Um, and then down here, the MAC address, last known MAC address that trips something is nothing, which is great. If I go further and type in show port dash security without interfaces at the end of it, I'll see that there is nothing in violation and life is good. So I'm going to test a very specific basic configuration, which is one MAC address and shut down. So if I see more than one MAC, shut the port down and that's it. Okay. Uh, th and there's, there's tons of options here. Please don't think this is the only way of doing things. And you would have to play with whatever other configuration you have in your environment using the same methodology. The interface, when it's tripped, it says error disabled. In my case, the port will also turn off. The LED will physically go off, which is kind of cool. Some will go red, some will go yellow, yellow, some will actually flash. So please find out how yours behave. An SNMP trap is sent if it's configured on the switch. Syslog messages are logged, which is kind of cool. And then the violation counter will increment. So in this example, I tripped it. And you can see there's the port we're on. You can see max secure address count one. Security violation count is one. The action was shut down. And then when I type in show log, you'll see that the port was actually shut down, changed state to down. And if you go back a little bit, you'll see that port security violation is why that happened. So there's many ways of figuring out if there is a port security violation. Please find out if you do have port security who is monitoring these logs or these traps or whatever mechanism you have. Because in some environments it's on and then people don't even monitor them because they feel it's not important. It's You've obviously done this for a reason, right? Now, um, when you actually get port security issues in this case, if I actually type in show interface gig 211, which is the one we're all on, it says the port is down. Line protocol is down. And here's the key, ERR dash disabled, error disabled. And the reason why that's important is if you are checking a port, if you do have software that checks ports, if you write scripts, Python, Perl, whatever it happens to be, and you are checking port statuses, that might be something you look for, right? And that way you'll be able to find out why things are happening. And you can see here's port security. It says status, secure shutdown. Violation mode is shut down. That's our configuration. And the MAC address that last tripped it is right here. So I know that I tripped the port security. To get the port up and running, in my case, I need to type in a shut, no shut, which is basically turn the port off and turn the port on. In some environments, you can just clear the port security counters or clear the ARP cache. There's, there's tons of ways of doing this. Um, this is just the easiest for me in my lab, and, and that works just fine. Now we're going to try a tap. In this scenario, I used a one gig copper tap. And you can see there's the port on the switch. There's the device going out into the world. And this is me watching this guy. In my case, I have two ports I could use for my monitoring. Now, I did trip port security because obviously my MAC address went into here and into there and into there. So the switch saw him and me, which is exactly what I expected. And then I did what most people don't do. <laughs> I actually went back and read my documentation. And there's an option for my tap called packet injection. So I can turn that off. And what that does is put my port into a listening only state, right? Kind of like a span port. You can do that with span, right? There's some vendors. So as soon as I did that, I turned packet injection off. Then I could see that I remained connected and that everything worked fine and I can capture my packets. So in this case, with that specific tap, I was able to get a workaround. But by default, this is the key, by default, I was tripping port security. So 
If your tap allows you to only receive the packets, you're in good shape. Okay, now here's just a few things to keep in mind. So what do you do if you need to access the network, copy trace files, or do some research while you're capturing packets? Well, then you need an additional Wi-Fi connection. Most laptops will have that. If it's a desktop, you need to have a Wi-Fi adapter if you want that option, or use a USB to Ethernet adapter uh, if you, so that we all have more than one Ethernet port to get on the network and so on. So this will work. But now you need to determine if your capture device, your laptop, your desktop, whatever you're capturing with, can handle the data rates. And, and please remember, when I say handle the data rates, I don't just mean 80% utilization. I also mean the timing accuracy. Because in most cases, you're trying to troubleshoot performance. You do not want your delta times to be skewed, right? A dedicated hardware packet capture tool would address this issue. But then you have to copy potentially large trace files back and forth to your computer. Now, I don't mean multi-gig files. Even if you had a 200 meg trace file, which is very, very common, and you have to copy that back and forth from a capture device, and you got to do that, oh, I don't know, a dozen times, it really gets to slow you down, and it really trips you up, and it causes a lot of delay overall, and, and confusion, and it breaks your, your kind of your rhythm, if you will. And please remember to clean the trace files off these capture devices. I've seen that a way too many times where I get on somebody's capture tool and there's trace files spend the last, I don't know, five, ten years on there. It's a, a housekeeping issue, a disk space issue, and a security issue if somebody else should get to those files. So now we're going to go on to the Profi Shark. So here's me with my USB port connected to the box. It goes to the switch and the other port goes to the device we're monitoring right here. So theoretically my USB port is involved, not my Ethernet. So therefore, I should not trip the port, but I, I want to make sure. I don't know if there's going to be some fictional virtual MAC address involved. Who knows? Let's find out, right? And guess what? It was fine. So I, after my test, the port is still connected. It doesn't have that error, right, that we saw earlier. And, and that's good because that makes perfect sense. Now, this, this gives me a whole bunch of pluses, right? So I know the Profi Shark will not drop packets because I've done a lot of testing. I know the timestamps are accurate. And if you go back to some of the other considerations that we were thinking about, um, we were talking about how do you get to the internet? How do you access network files? Well, I've still got my Ethernet and my Wi-Fi port available. So all of that is addressed, right? The other thing you really have to pay attention to, uh, that's not covered here, but I'm just kind of throwing this out there because it becomes a common issue. Uh, what happens if you run Wireshark right from the client's computer? Because that's obviously an option as well. Well, a few things. One, can you install software on that corporate computer? Uh, and if you can, well, how accurate are those timestamps going to be? And at what point does that computer uh, keep up or not keep up with the packet rates as well? Whew. So hopefully all that helps. I know I try to jam a lot in 13 minutes of stuff, but... 